We are broadcasting from the studios of UNC TV. It's great to be here as your moderator, and I want to get right to introducing the candidates. Senator Kay Hagan, the Democratic candidate for the United States Senate. Of course, she is currently serving as U.S. Senator for North Carolina. Welcome, Senator Hagan. Thank you. And Speaker Tom Tillis, the Republican candidate for the United States Senate. He currently serves as the Speaker of the House in North Carolina's state legislature. Welcome to you, Speaker Tillis. Thank you. Good evening. And as you know, the rules for tonight's debate, we're going to start with opening statements. Then the candidates are going to respond to questions that have been suggested by members of the state's broadcast news, but the news directors in the state, along with input from me and my team. For the next part of the debate, the candidates will have an opportunity to ask each other questions directly. And finally, we're going to have closing statements. We want you to know that the order of the opening and closing statements and which candidate gets the first question were determined and agreed to prior to this debate by the candidates and their campaigns. And Senator Hagan's going to have the first opening statement also the first questions, Senator Hagan. George, thanks for being here tonight. And viewers all across uh, North Carolina, thank you so much for tuning in. North Carolinians need a common sense voice, a voice that will stand up for our middle class, fight for our military, and protect the promises that we have made to our seniors. At a time when we need leaders to unite around our family's best interests, Speaker Tillis has built a record of dividing our state always putting the wealthy and big corporations first. He's gutted education, killed an equal pay bill, made college more expensive, and said no to health care for 500,000 North Carolinians. And folks, he is campaigning on a promise to take that destructive agenda to Washington. We say North Carolina's the state where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great. Speaker Tillis feels that those who have the most they should get the most help. I believe that our middle class comes first and that everyone deserves the opportunity to grow both strong and great. Speaker, tell us. Thank you, George, and thanks everybody for joining us. Last week, President Obama said every one of his policies, every single one of them, are on the ballot this November. Senator Hagan's voted with President Obama 96% of the time. <coughs> she served as a rubber stamp for President Obama's failed policies. She promised she'd go to Washington and get things done, and she's failed her promise, or she's broken her promise. We need a senator that knows what it's like to struggle to make ends meet while, while going to college and raising a family. I've done that, and I've realized the American dream. When I was in the legislature, I fulfilled my promise to cut spending and to cut taxes and to get people back to work. We need to do that same thing in Washington. Senator Hagan went to Washington. She promised that she'd be different, and she broke her promise. If you want the same failed policies of President Obama, you'd vote for Kay Hagan. If you think it's time to change the direction of this country and make it a great again, I hope you'll vote for Tom Tillis. Okay, first question goes to you, Senator Hagan. As you know, uh, Speaker Tillis has made the fight against uh, ISIS, has taken center stage now in this race. And I know you've had some differences with how President Obama has handled this in the past, but do you fully support President Obama's policy and mission right now, and are you confident it will succeed? You know, George, these individuals are terrorists. They have attacked Americans. Our mission should be to eradicate these terrorists. I have been decisive about taking out ISIS and the Corazon. I think it's part of a two-part strategy. The first is airstrikes. And we need to take out the weapon stockpile, the training grounds, and the command and control centers. The second part is arming and training the moderate Syrian rebels. All of this has to be done within a broad coalition of Middle Eastern partners. Right now, we have Arab states joining in. We have Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, Bahrain, and Jordan. But it, it has to be a unified front. And I think when I see what Speaker Tillis has done, um, he is waffling on these issues. He is spineless on what he would do to take ISIS out. I have been clear. I have been decisive. But I think we need to hear what Speaker Tillis would do as far so, as what he would do. So is there anything President Obama is not doing that you would do? You know, I think that obviously uh, troops on the ground is a big issue that, that has everybody's concern. I think that when I look at what's uh, taken place in the U.S. over the last 12 to 13 years, uh, that we have, we've been at wars, two wars. We have many domestic needs at home. Uh, we need to let the Iraqis and the Syrians fight this battle on the ground. Uh, I do think that we need to have a reauthorization of the authority uh, for the use of military force. And I have called on the president to bring that before Congress. I would go back to Washington in a moment's notice 
to have a full debate in Congress on that use. Speaker Tillis. You know, Senator, Senator Hagan and President Obama, this is a policy that needs to be on the ballot in November. They have failed the American people and they've made our nation and the world less safe and less secure. They're coming up with a strategy to solve a problem that they largely created. They withdrew despite what Leon Panetta said, despite what Secretary Gates said. They left and created a vacuum in Iraq and the ISIS terrorists filled it. The president has continued to fail and show uh, almost a strategy of, uh, of peace through weakness. And these terrorists that need to be wiped off the face of the planet have taken advantage of it. Of course, we, of course we should have a no-fly zone over Syria. We should revoke the passports of Americans who are fighting with ISIS in the Middle East. We should take several steps. And the other thing we shouldn't do, George, and this is a big issue, we shouldn't continue to telegraph to the terrorists who want to destroy America and our allies and tell them what we're not going to do. Well, let me follow up on that, on this issue of boots on the ground. When I was speaking to House Speaker John Boehner, last week. He told me that if other nations don't step forward, the United States would have no choice but to put boots on the ground. Do you agree? I think one of the reasons why many nations uh, are afraid to step forward is because this president has failed to lead the world. Normally in crises like these, the president is considered to be the leader of the free world. He rallies nations together to put down terrorist threats like ISIS. But now the, 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 our allies, our friends across the world really don't know where this president stands because he telegraphs his place. He gives strength to the terrorists by telling them what we're not going to do. He should have everything on the table and he should build some credibility and Senator Hagan should be right there with them. George Speaker Tillis did not answer your question. He is wait, uh, waffling on all of these issues. He actually told the Raleigh newspaper that he didn't know what should be done. Um, as, as far as your question, um, I do think it is high time that the moderate Syrian rebels get armed, get trained, as well as the Iraqis. I asked the question to General Dempsey at the hearing before we had the vote to arm and train the moderate Syrian rebels uh, about the process of vetting the soldiers in Iraq. He said we've gotten very good at vetting and he felt that there were half of a number of the battalions that we could begin that process and get them on the ground. I think we need to look at Turkey and what Turkey is going to, uh, whether they're going to step up. What's amazing to me is as somebody who's looking from the outside and not getting briefings that Senator Hagan is getting, is that Senator Hagan for the last year as ISIS has emerged as a threat has failed to show up to more than half of the foreign affairs committees to get an update that we would all like to see our senator asking. We're the third largest military presence of any state in the nation. I think that you move heaven and earth, you get rid of the calendar commitments or the conflicts that you may have, and you go there and educate us on what the options are. Senator Hagan, I'd like to know, for example, what priorities there were that were greater that caused you to miss more than half the meetings over the last year so we'd have a better understanding of what you're doing and how you're acting. I might get to that in the questions later. You guys have a chance to question each other then. I want to go to my second question right now on the issue of education. And this one goes to you, Speaker Tillis. As you know, uh, Common Core education standards were created by state education chiefs governors in 48 states. North Carolina adopted them. Uh, but the governor, Governor McCrory, recently signed legislation that will result in replacing those standards with new ones. I know you've said you oppose the Common Core standards, but do you support any national education standards? Of course we have to have standards. We need to know how our kids in North Carolina are matching up against the other states and other nations. What I oppose is a, is a bureaucracy, the Department of Education, that was not in created until 1980, after I graduated from high school, with 5,000 bureaucrats making on average $102,000 a year, stifling what teachers want to do in the classroom. The problem with Common Core is that teachers were being more worried about how they meet up to the standards than what they really want to do, pursuing their passion, educating the kids. Common Core, No Child Left Behind, Race to the Top, all had strings attached to them. The federal government spends about 15% uh, the, uh, about 15% of our funding comes from the federal government, but the government is controlling the classroom. I want standards that make absolutely certain that our children are learning math and science and technology, engineering. But I also want to make sure the teachers feel like they're empowered to do what they have to do to educate these children. That's their passion. That's what they want to do, and they want government out of the way. Senator Hagan. 
George, once again, he did not answer your question. The Common Core was not put together by the Department of Education in Washington. It was put together by governors and by state, setting high expectations for students all across this country so that we could not only compete against one another within our states, but we would be more competitive on a global basis. But what Speaker Tillis has done, He's done tax cuts for the wealthy, and he has gutted our education system. He has cut $500 million from public education. And you know what that means, folks? That means fewer teachers in the classroom. That means larger classroom sizes. And that means outdated textbooks, if there's any textbooks at all. I can imagine the number of teachers that have told me what textbooks. I was actually in Pinehurst recently. A third grader, a little girl from third grade, told me that she raises her hand every day in the classroom and she's no longer called on because there's 32 students in her class. Speaker Tillis has gutted our education system. A lot of times tonight, you're gonna to hear Senator Hagan make that same claim, which has been proven false by fact checkers, by the News and Observer, by Washington media outlets. It's simply false. Since 2011, we're spending a billion dollars more a year in education. This year, we provided an average 7% pay increase for teachers. We had to catch up the newer teachers because they were getting behind and we weren't competitive with our neighboring states. Next year, we're gonna give them another 7% raise. That's what we're doing to turn education around. And the, and the nonsense and the things that have been proven false really just distorts the argument that Senator Hagan's having. Senator Hagan needs to spend more time in North Carolina and understand the good things that we're doing for our teachers and our students. You get the last word on this issue. Um, George, once again, Speaker Tillis is, is incorrect here. Uh, when we are now 48th in the nation, folks, on what we p spend per pupil, so we might be spending more on education, but we have so many thousands more students, it's being diluted. And that 7% raise, I've talked to teachers, senior teachers who have been there 20 plus years that are getting a 0.29% raise. He took away the longevity pay that's built in. Some teachers actually got a tax, a tax uh, an income cut. We need to do more for education because it is our entire future. Next question is on health care goes to you, Senator Hagan. This week marks the one year anniversary of the Affordable Care Act rollout. And I wonder, has your view changed on that law at all in the past year? And are there any legislative changes you would make in the Affordable Care Act? Uh, thank you, George. Um, as you said, it, it has been uh, a year. Um, I think when we look at the Affordable Care Act, I think there are some common sense fixes that need to be made to this bill. As I talk to people all across North Carolina, what they're sharing with me though, is that they want the politics taken out of this. They don't wanna go back to a broken system. They don't wanna go back to a time when if you had a preexisting condition, you are unable to get health insurance. Seniors would be paying more for their prescription drugs and women would pay more for coverage than they do today. Some of the common sense fixes that I think we ought to be looking at. Uh, one, we have taken care of a small business paperwork, a 1099 requirement. The other thing is, I think we need to look at the 30 hour week uh, and versus what is currently uh, in the Affordable Care Act. And the other is to have a copper plan. Uh, I think people are familiar with the gold, silver, bronze. We need to look at a copper uh, that would be cheaper and primarily targeted towards young people. But Speaker Tillis would repeal this law and take us back to a broken system. You know, of course, the Affordable Care Act, the heart of President Obama's legislative program, and Speaker Tillis mentioned the comments the president made uh, last week, and he said his policies are on the ballot, every single one of them, do you agree? You know, Speaker Tillis wants to make this race about the president. This race is about who is going to represent North Carolina in the U.S. Senate. And I think North Carolinians want a common sense voice. Speaker Tillis. You know, when you vote with the president 96% of the time, you represent the president's policies, the policies that are going to be on the ballot in November. Obamacare is one of the most disastrous regulatory frameworks that have ever been passed in the history of the United States. It's destabilizing health care for 250 million Americans who were satisfied with their plan to try and solve a problem that exists. Of course, we should address issues like pre-existing conditions, letting kids under the age of 26 continue to be on their parents' health plans. 
But Senator Hagan's broken a promise 24 different times on this issue. Senator Hagan promised the people of North Carolina 24 different times, if you like your doctor, you can keep it. If you like your health care, you can keep it. We know that promise is false because 473,000 people got cancellation notices last year. The president cleverly decided to delay that till next year when the cancellations are going to come out again. And over the last couple of weeks, 50,000 retirees in 11 counties in North Carolina are getting cancellation, notice, cancellation notices. And what they're going to get on the 15th are premium increases and fewer options. It's a failed policy. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be repealed. And then we need to come up with common sense solutions, not broken promises. Let me follow up on that, though, Mr. Speaker. How is that going to happen? If you repeal the Affordable Care Act, how are you going to actually be able to come up with policies that care for the children who are 26 and under and for those with pre-existing conditions? Implement them. I mean, reach across the aisle. Senator Hagan talks about it's time to finally have somebody reach across the aisle and get things done. I believe that there are senators who would actually, Democrat senators who say, you know what, that makes sense. Adding a trillion dollars to the debt, which is what Obamacare will do, doesn't make sense. Robbing Medicare of $700 billion over the next 10 years by reducing doctor reimbursements and hospital reimbursements do not make sense. Having a child under the age of 26 on their parents' health plan makes perfect sense. Having a treatment for pre-existing conditions, perfect sense. I believe the American people would embrace it and they would, be, they would quickly embrace not having the two and a half million, do, uh, two and a half million equivalent jobs lost through this regulatory overreach. George, I don't think he answered your question again. Let me tell you what he's done to the state of North Carolina. No state exchange, what would certainly help the people in North Carolina. But the other big factor is rejecting Medicaid in our state. 500,000 people in this state unable to receive care. Those people still get sick. What do they do? They go to the emergency room, which is the most expensive care, and it's not even treatment. That is not right. He could with a, you know, just like that could have made that happen. And the other thing, his former company, PricewaterhouseCooper, has actually written a report that said states that didn't expand Medicaid, their hospitals are suffering. In North Carolina, we've already had one hospital closed because of no Medicaid expansion. You know, we didn't implement a state exchange because we predicted what has happened at the federal level. It was a failure. Everybody knows the stories about the state exchange. It was a failure. You know how much it costs for that website now? Two billion dollars. We understood that was bait coming to try and advance a failed policy, a policy that's killing two and a half million equivalent jobs, a policy that's robbing Medicare of seven hundred billion dollars breaking a promise to seniors, breaking a promise to people who were happy with their health plans. I'm answering that question, Senator Hagan. I think you need to answer why you told people 24 times if they like their health care, they can keep it. And at what point was that not true? And why did you continue to say it? Move on to the Supreme Court right now. Uh, and this question is for you, Speaker Tillis. Uh, as you know, yesterday the Supreme Court term began and they decided not to take up the issue of same-sex marriage, which means the uh, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals decision, which just struck down the ban in Virginia, will apply here in North Carolina as well. I know you said you would fight this. On what grounds and can you win? Well, you know, two years ago, 60% of the voters said that they wanted to define the institution as, a, as an institution of marriage between a man and a woman. I feel it's my responsibility, after 60% of the people voted that into law, to defend the laws of the state. I also think we're in a dangerous time in, in this country where the president has appointed liberal activist judges and Senator Hagan has endorsed them or, or, or confirmed them that are literally trying to legislate from the bench. Senator Hagan asked Eric Holder, our attorney general, to sue North Carolina for the voter ID bill. Seventy percent of North Carolinians thinks it makes sense to present an ID to restore confidence in elections. Senator Hagan went to Washington and asked the federal government to sue us. The federal government is continuing and the judicial system is continuing to become an activist legislative branch. I think that's dangerous and it's denying states to do the things that they want to do. What North Carolina may want to do is what North Carolinians should decide, not Senator Hagan and the courts up in Washington. But, sir, let me follow up on that. If the federal district court here in North Carolina uh, follows through on, on the Supreme Court's decision and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals decision and rules the ban unconstitutional, is that the law of North Carolina? Well, I, the, uh, we're going to continue to take our case because that's not been decided yet. But there are other circuits that have not decided. Ultimately, we hope that this does go to the Supreme Court. 
Thank you, George. You know, no two families look alike, but all families want to do the best for their children and their grandchildren. I do not think anyone, including the government, should tell somebody who they love or who they can marry. Speaker Tillis put Amendment 1 on the ballot in North Carolina. He actually said he had to put it on the ballot in a May primary because it wouldn't have passed in November. He's actually also hiring lawyers paying for lawyers out of taxpayer dollars to take this suit to court. Speaker Tillis has said that they will continue to fight this case in spite of what the Supreme Court's denial has been as far as letting these, uh, these issues stand. Um, you know, I opposed Amendment 1, which banned gay marriage in North Carolina. Um, and I want to flip back to uh, one of the issues that Speaker Tillis is talking about. Um, you know, I think he wants to talk about percentages. I want to talk about percentages. A hundred percent of the time, Speaker Tillis's policies have hurt North Carolina. Gutted education, killed an equal pay bill, no Medicaid expansion. That's what he says as being effective. Ninety-six percent of the time, Senator Hagan's voted with President Obama. And President Obama says when you vote in, in the November election, that you're voting for his policies. Senator Hagan went to Raleigh, or went to Washington, left Raleigh, turned her back on it, went to Washington, and has voted with the president 96% of the time. She's confirmed liberal activist judges that are denying states the right to govern themselves. She's ignoring the citizens of North Carolina who voted 60% for this bill. I'd like to have a senator that goes to Washington and, and the only independence that she's shown there is independence from North Carolinians. I'd like for her to come back home, listen to North Carolinians, and represent our interests better. 30 seconds. George, I think the people of North Carolina know that I come home every weekend. And I've held a town hall meeting in every 100 counties throughout North Carolina. Uh, but once again, he's talking about percentages. Folks, 100% of the time, he has failed. His policies have failed people in North Carolina. And, you know, I have been ranked the most moderate senator in the country by the nonpartisan National Journal. They rank senators one to a hundred. I am smack dab in the middle. That means I can work across the aisle with Democrats and Republicans. Smack dab in the middle is exactly the place North Carolina is. Next question is on immigration. It goes to you, Senator Hagan. As you know, all of us this summer saw the images of unaccompanied immigrant children from Central America coming across our southern border illegally uh, this summer. Almost more than 1,600 of them have been brought to North Carolina as their cases work through the courts. Should these children be returned home? Uh, you know, George, the immigration system in our country is broken, and I think inaction is not an option. I have talked to many people, businesses, farmers throughout North Carolina. And after listening to the Farm Bureau, our North Carolina uh, businesses, the National Chamber of Commerce, I support immigration reform. I am one of the senators who voted for the common sense bipartisan immigration reform. Along with me, John McCain, Marco Rubio, Lindsey Graham have all supported that bill. Speaker Tillis will tell you he, he does not support it, primarily because of border security issues, some of the issues that you're bringing up right now. As far as these children coming up from Central America, I think that we need to help fund the Southern Command of our military that can really get to the root cause of why these children are leaving. Some of them are being, or their families are paying the, uh, the traffickers to send their children up north. Um, without doing that, we are not going to solve this problem. And I think these children will go through the court system, but I do think some of them will get asylum and many of them will be returned So not, home. All, not all of them have to be returned home? I think go through the, the system, through the asylum, but I think a number, a large number of them will be uh, sent home to their families. Senator Hagan struggled to answer that question. Let me be clear. The tragedy that these children are going through is truly a tragedy. They need to be reunited with their families and the nations that are aiding, abetting human traffickers, taking these children through incredibly horrible circumstances need to be told if you do that there are going to be consequences. A strong nation needs a strong border. A strong nation needs to know who's coming into this country and, and what threat they may represent to us. We need to get the border secure. We need to implement and we need to make it clear. Incidentally, there's another policy on the ballot. President Obama said he's going to wait and do immigration after the election. We all know that he's going to implement amnesty and we all know that Senator Hagan will support it. 
There's been a mistake in this country that not sealing the border, this has been a bipartisan failure. Republicans and Democrats have failed on this issue. We need to get serious about sealing the border. Do that first. Make it very clear that people are not going to break in line and we're not going to have blanket amnesty and then solve the problem here versus the empty words that continue to come out of President Obama and Senator Hagan on immigration. 30 seconds. George, Speaker Tillis will not say why he won't support immigration reform. A number of senators, we have passed this comprehensive common sense bill. Um, it does not include amnesty. I don't think Speaker Tillis understands the definition of amnesty, but it is not amnesty. And as far as the executive orders, I have called on the president not to execute executive orders. I don't think from an immigration standpoint that that's the way to go. This is too big for our country, but I certainly support the common sense bipartisan immigration reform bill that we passed and Speaker Tillis should say why he will not. 30 seconds. Senator Hagan says, one thing, but she does another. She says she's directed the president not to act alone on this issue, but she voted against an amendment that was trying to be offered by the Senate to do just that. The fact of the matter is, Senator Hagan has failed the people of North Carolina and the nation by not securing our border. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got an Ebola outbreak. We have bad actors that can come across the, the border. We need to seal the border and secure it. We need to make it very clear that blanket amnesty is not on the table. And then we need to solve, for the first time in decades, the problem that we have with immigration in this country. You brought me to my next question. I want to talk about the Ebola outbreak right now. You've called on President Obama to ban travel from the West African countries at the center of this, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. But last week I was speaking with the director of the Senators, Centers for Disease Control, and he told me that this kind of a ban would backfire and be counterproductive. What's your response to that, and what else should the government be doing? Well, it, it's very clear that the president doesn't know what to do yet. I know the CDC is working hard. I don't know that they're working smart. You can see the protocols with the hospital in Dallas were not followed, and now we've got the potential threat of exposure. Hopefully that doesn't happen. We haven't had an exposure in the, in the country yet. Hopefully we can keep it that way. The reason that I suggest that the common sense ban on travel was to give the CDC time to figure out how we can make sure when somebody gets on a commercial jetliner and they fly from Liberia to Brussels to Dallas and to Dallas, that they're not exposing hundreds of people to the virus. We need to protect the safety and security of the American people. You do that by first limiting and reducing the threat as much as possible. The president hasn't done that. Other nations in Western Africa have done that. They've implemented travel bans to try and make sure that they're keeping their people safe and secure, their citizens. We need to do the same thing. And we also need to send resources to West Africa, the best that we have because we've got the best doctors in the world to try and help solve the problem and help those countries. Senator Hagan. You know, George, in this issue, I think that we need to work with a coalition of international partners on how we can fight this epidemic and ultimately stop it. A travel ban could be one part of a broad range of issues on how we can work through this. You know, just a recent... So you're open to that? I am open it to it to a broad range. But the problem is that's if you isolate those countries, you're not going to solve the problem. The problem is how are we going to stop this virus, contain it, and ultimately uh, kill it? Um, I think the, in Congress we passed recently close to $100 million, uh, which will help go towards the research and development of Ebola therapies and to global health programs. Um, I personally have talked to infectious disease physicians here in North Carolina and our hospital officials and association in North Carolina. Uh, they've assured me that our hospitals have the tools they need and are prepared. I also think that every healthcare special uh, uh, official should be on high alert and take every precaution necessary in case a patient comes before the hospital. Senator Hagan's equivocated on what a ban would mean to her. I want to be very clear. Until the CDC can convince me that we are able to intervene with anyone who represents a threat to the safety and security of this country, then we've got to prevent them from traveling here. We need to make sure that we get doctors and, and specialists to Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and the other nations who've been afflicted by this disease, but we have to protect the safety and security of this country. It's another failure, like the, the failure of ISIS and a number of other policy issues where our safety and security is at risk. Senator Hagan needs to step up and address these problems. Senator Hagan? 
As I said, I think this should be part of a broader range of, of issues. I am pleased that in North Carolina, one of our own companies has put forth research and development and a trial medication is being used on the patient in Dallas right now. I think that shows positive movement uh, in what we have done within our own state of North Carolina. Uh, but I do think that we cannot use scare tax tactics on an issue that this broad. And I believe what you're hearing from Speaker Tillis is scare tactics. And I think that he is using this in a very, very serious way. I want to move on to the economy and jobs. The question is for you, Senator Hagan. Unemployment rate here in North Carolina, 6.8 percent. National rate, 5.9 percent. What is your read of the economy right now? And given the fact that uh, Congress and the president seem to be stalemated on legislation, is there anything you believe President Obama should be doing on his own right now to strengthen the economy? Uh, George, in North Carolina, we've got some great places uh, that are that are hot in the job market, but then we've got high unemployment, particularly in our rural areas. As I said, I've had a town hall meeting in every hundred county. Without fail, jobs and the economic recovery is the number one priority for people in North Carolina. Um, I think that we need to work together. I think we need to have overall a tax reform that I think would make a difference. I think we need to look at more advanced manufacturing and bring more advanced manufacturing back to this country. You know, I've got a bill called the Repatriation Bill. We've got U.S. global companies in North Carolina and around the United States. There's a trillion dollars sitting overseas based on our tax policy. To bring that money in, they'd pay 35 percent. My bill, which is co-sponsored by John McCain, would allow that money to come back in at 8 percent. They could buy that rate down to 5 if they hire American workers. We would have a trillion dollars coming into this country. We could put together the money 50, 60, 80 billion dollars into an infrastructure fund that we then could leverage and put people back to work rebuilding this country. And that would increase thousands and millions of jobs. Speaker tell us. Senator Hagan's solution is spending more money. It's very simple. Government needs to get out of the way. We need to, we need to get our spending under control and we need to reduce regulations. Senator Hagan, when she cast a deciding vote for Obamacare, voted to kill the equivalent of two and a half million jobs. Senator Hagan's silence on the EPA overreach is silent consent for regulatory burdens on businesses that are going to kill hundreds of thousands of jobs. Senator Hagan's vote on sequestration, indiscriminate cuts to the military are going to result in 20 to 30,000 jobs being lost down east. Those are not the ways you create jobs. Government kills jobs. Small businesses, large businesses create jobs. We need to stop putting burdens on them, like the burdens that Senator Hagan allowed the EPA to place on evergreen packaging out in western North Carolina. I had to sign a bill to prevent a thousand jobs from being lost, one of the last two bills I had to sign before we got out of session. The overreach is destroying our opportunities. We have got to get to a point to where regulations are responsible and allowing businesses, not government, to create jobs. 30 seconds. George, let me tell you about Speaker Tillis's tax policy and jobs policy. He's sending our teachers to Texas, our film jobs to Georgia, and our Medicaid dollars to 28 other states. That's his failed economic policy. When he cut taxes for the wealthy, he's gutted our education system. He's making college more expensive. He's now put a sales tax on every student's meal plan. And he did away with the 529 college savings tax credit so parents could save to send their children to college. I know that a sound education and a strong university community college system is what makes for a sound economy. And Speaker Tillis has totally the wrong plans for people in North Carolina. When Senator Hagan was senior appropriations chair in the legislature, she made a promise to the citizens of North Carolina. We were in a rough patch and she needed to implement a sales tax. It harmed the poor and working families more than anyone else. Senator Hagan then went so far as to break her promise. She said it was going to be temporary and then she voted to make part of it permanent. Senator Hagan has continued to misunder or actually misrepresent what we're doing here. We cut the sales tax. We fulfilled the promise that Senator Hagan made broke. We came back and in the first six months we fulfilled it. We cut the sales tax that helps the poor and working families most of all. Those are the kinds of things that we need to do in Washington. They're the exact opposite of what Senator Hagan's voted for with President Obama and his policies that are going to be on the ballot 
in just about four weeks. Let's talk a little bit more about Washington. I think one thing Democrats and Republicans agree on, Washington is broken right now. And Speaker Tillis, I guess the question for you is how can you change that if you go? And I want you to start by naming at least one big issue where you would disagree and take on your party's leadership. Well, you know, I think what we ought to do is, is talk about the things that we can do to actually move legislation, like 350 bills that have gone from the House and went to Harry Reid's desk. Senator Hagan's been quiet. She's talking about, she's talking about bipartisan leadership, but let's talk about regulatory reform. Let's talk about repealing Obamacare. Let's talk about putting the EPA back into check instead of destroying jobs. You know, the, the that the problem that we have with Washington is it's broke. The people are not communicating across the aisle. Senator Hagan, over six years, has not authored a single bill that's gone to the president's desk. That's a problem. We need people that are going to bring people together. In areas where we can't agree, don't take the time and, and, and move into areas where we can agree. Take time to find policies that can create jobs versus kill them, like Obamacare. Two and a half million jobs equivalent. 600,000 jobs with the EPA overreach. Let's reduce regulations and create jobs. That is something I've got to believe we can all agree on. Let me ask the question again. On which issue would you take on your party's leadership? The, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. At this point, it's kind of hard to say because in the Senate, which I'll speak for the Senate, not for the House, President or, or Harry Reid hasn't allowed anything to be passed. You know, George, you know this better than most people. When you have the House and 350 bills to the Senate, and you only have a few dozen votes uh, in the House, and only a few vo dozen votes in the Senate, it's hard to figure out where the, uh, where the differences would be because they're not debating. There's no such thing as regular order. Senator Hagan has rubber stamped Harry Reid's policy, I'm sure requested by President Obama, to shut down the Senate, save all these tough votes until after the election. You need to understand, delaying the mandates and, and, and delaying amnesty are all election issues that are on the ballot and you have an opportunity to stop it. You get a minute? You want to ask him your question again? It's against the rules. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the Keystone Pipeline. I disagree with the president. I think we need to build the Keystone Pipeline. Trade deals. I have voted against trade deals because they sent too many North Carolina jobs overseas. And I voted against my own party's budget because it had too deep of cuts to our military. Speaker Tillis, on the other hand, would have supported a budget that would turn Medicare into a voucher program. He, he would have supported sequestration. He would have supported a government shutdown. And when he would have supported the government shutdown in North Carolina when that took place, it was the height of our fall leaf season out west and our fishing season in the east. That is what Speaker Tillis would have done. 30 seconds. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Senator Hagan brought up sequestration because I did have members in the, in the caucus uh, support that bill. I wouldn't have. And Senator Hagan did. Senator Hagan voted for sequestration, which are indiscriminate cuts that are harming our military, and they're also harming jobs in the, uh, in the military sector over in eastern North Carolina, down east as we call it in North Carolina. 20 to 30,000 jobs. I would have absolutely opposed that, opposed the leadership for doing it. And there are a number of other minor examples like that. But the big issue with Washington is it's broke. And Senator Hagan has allowed Harry Reid to shut down Congress and not send legislation to the president's desk. Okay, we're at the portion of the debate now where you all ask each other questions. Uh, and according to the rules, it's been agreed that Senator Hagan will receive the first candidate question. Speaker, tell us your question for Senator Hagan. Senator Hagan, last week, President Obama said all of his policies are on the ballot in this election. And you voted with the president 96% of the time. So my question to you is, now that you've claimed to be a moderate, claimed to be independent, which of the policies out of the 96% that you've supported do you regret? Uh, you know, uh, Speaker Tillis, um, as, far, as far as policies, uh, 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 President's policies on the ballot right now, I don't think you understand two things. One, the effectiveness. I don't think you know my record. America Works bill passed. Tuition assistance bill passed. Camp Lejeune water contamination bill passed. The, that, to me, is being effective for the people in North Carolina. However, your idea of being effective is tax cuts for the wealthy, gutting public education by $500 million. And yes, that is a fact. 
The fact that you've made college more expensive, doing away with the 529 college plans, a tax on students' meal plans, doing away with the earned income tax credit that affects 64,000 military families in our state. You know, Speaker Tillis, your idea of effectiveness is hurting the people of North Carolina every day. Well, Senator Hagan, I assume by the fact that you haven't mentioned a single vote that you regret, that you're proud of the fact that you voted with the president 96% of the time. And that's why I think it's fair to make this election, as the president himself said about his policies. Senator Hagan voted with the president 96% of the time. President Obama said all of his policies are on the ballot. Policies that are killing jobs, policies that are making our nation less safe and less secure, policies that are failing to match the threat against ISIS, policies that are not right for America. We need to make America great again. We do it through strong leadership. We do it by making tough decisions, like the tough decisions we made in North Carolina, which is making North Carolina perform better than most other states. We came from far behind, a 4%, our fourth highest unemployment rate when I came in, now we're near the national average. We need leadership and people who will stand up to the president, but Senator Hagan's told you tonight, the president's policies are on the ballot. She supported them 96% of the time, and she doesn't regret a single vote. Senator Hagan, time for you to ask a question to Speaker Tillis. Speaker Tillis, North Carolina women earn just 82 cents on the dollar compared to their male counterparts. In the General Assembly, you killed an equal pay bill, and you've said you don't support a proposed equal pay bill in Congress. Why don't you support these bills to ensure that women get equal pay for equal work. Well, Senator Hagan, you, you probably know that there are laws on the books that, that it's against the law to do something that any employer does. He should pay the consequences. Men and women, my mother, who worked hard uh, and, and helped us actually make ends meet, my wife, my daughter, and a number of other people have worked, uh, women deserve the same pay as men. Let's enforce the laws that are on the books versus some of the campaign gimmicks that are going to put more regulations on businesses and make it even more difficult. Women in North Carolina are disproportionately out of work since President Obama's come into office and Senator Hagan supported his policies. Minorities are disproportionately out of work. Let's focus on getting them back to work and getting a thriving uh, environment, a, a thriving business environment that will actually increase salaries and make it better for these women, 40% of whom, whom are head of households in this state. We need to focus on policies to get the economy back on track, not just another rubber stamp for another regulatory policy that makes it harder for businesses to grow jobs in North Carolina. You get a response, Senator. Speaker Tillis, I think you need to read reports. Women in North Carolina earn 82 cents on the dollar. I didn't raise my two daughters to think that they were worth 82 cents on the dollar. The first bill that I co-sponsored when I got to the Senate was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. We need to build on that law and pass the Paycheck Fairness Act, which is the Equal Pay Bill. But Speaker Tillis, I don't think you understand that the bottom line when women get more money affects not just women, but it affects their entire families. Husbands want their women to get equal pay. You know, Speaker Tillis, I've been a woman in the workplace. I know the obstacles that women face. Let's just give women equal pay for equal work. Well, Senator Hagan, I absolutely think we should give equal pay to equal work, and those employers that don't do it should bear the consequences based on the laws that are already on the books. My mother worked hard. My grandmother was a single mom. My grandfather passed away when my, my, during the Depression era where she had to work every single day. I know she was discriminated against, and that was wrong. That's why the Equal Pay Act was passed. We need to make sure that my daughter, who will start nursing next year, she better get paid the same amount as a man of the, of the, of the same skill set, or there should be consequences for that. What we don't need to do is put another regulation in place like Obamacare and all these other regulations that are killing jobs and harming women in disproportionate numbers in this state. Let's make sure we have equal time. You get 30 more seconds. 
George, Speaker Tillis said the Equal Pay Act was passed. It has not been passed, and he opposes that bill. Speaker Tillis even opposes the minimum wage. He said the minimum wage is a dangerous idea. And Speaker Tillis, Mitt Romney thinks we should increase the minimum wage. You've said that that's a state policy, and yet you've done nothing in North Carolina to increase the minimum wage in our state. You know, Speaker Tillis doesn't want hardworking North Carolinians to get $10 an hour, but he sees nothing wrong with the CEO making $10 million a year who deserves an extra tax break. Time for your second question to speak, Senator Hagan. Senator Hagan, last year the threat of ISIS was clear. Back in the early part of this year, President Obama called ISIS the JV team. For the last year, you've sat on the Foreign Affairs Committee and you've missed half the meetings. You've also chaired the Subcommittee on Emerging Threats, and you haven't had a single meeting on the threat of ISIS. Can you explain to me what other commitments you had that you thought were more important than sitting in the committee, getting advice from our military commanders, and also making sure you're asking questions that North Carolinians want to know in these public meetings so that we had a better understanding of what was going on, what the real threat was, and then what you were going to do to help improve our safety and security, but I'm mainly interested in where were you and why were other commitments more important than sitting in that Foreign Affairs Committee? Well, let me clarify something, George. I am not on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I serve on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, and Speaker Tillis... Well, I stand corrected. May I ask, uh, were, you, you, were you not present for 50 percent of those meetings? George, I'm on the Armed Services Committee. Okay. It so seems if, like if what I, you're I saying to clear, me, Speaker Tillis, I, I understand your question. Okay. seems what you are saying is that I am not briefed on the issues at hand having to do in particular with ISIS. Please know that a year ago, this past spring, at a hearing, I actually asked about arming and training the moderate Syrian rebels at that time. That was actually before we knew what ISIS was. And I really think that if we had taken that step, we would not have seen the proliferation of these barbaric, barbaric terrorists rise to the extent that they have today. Please know that I have chaired numerous counterterrorism hearings. I have met with General Dempsey, who's chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary Hagel, on numerous occasions. Recently, we had a closed briefing and we had an open uh, meeting with Secretary Hagel and General Dempsey. I asked numerous questions and at the closed briefing, I was probably the last senator to leave after three or four hours of open dialogue about what we need to do as far as ISIS. Um, so, folks, I am well informed on these issues. I have been decisive on what to do to take out ISIS in the Corazon. But once again, Speaker Tillis has waffled. He told the news and record he had no idea what he would do. He yep. has not articulated one thing, whether he would arm and train the moderate Syrian rebels, what his plan would be. 30 seconds each. 30. I wonder how much more information I'd have if my senator from North Carolina who sits on the Armed Services Committee would show up for work. She missed more than half of the meetings. Those meetings are to inform you and me about what's going on and what the threats are and what the military commanders and the people who have knowledge on the ground are going to do. Senator Hagan seems to think it doesn't matter to show up to public meetings. More than half the time she had to be somewhere. I'd like to know where she was. But we've got to make sure that the people are informed. People are scared. People are worried about our safety and security. <laughs> I will go to Washington and I'll show up for those Armed Services Committee meetings. I'll make sure that the parents down in Lejeune and Bragg and other bases know that I care. I want to know what the status is. I want them to be informed. 30 seconds. Then, Speaker Tillis, you ought to say what you would do with ISIS. I think the people of North Carolina, and particularly our service members, our troops, should understand what you want to do and what your plan would be, and you will not say. And, folks, Speaker Tillis' hometown newspaper actually called on him to resign because he'd missed so many days in the session because he was out fundraising. Senator Hagan, now it's time for your second question to Speaker Tillis. Thank you, George. You know, many North Carolinians depend on student loans to finance their dream of going to college. Speaker Tillis, why do you oppose a bill that would let graduates refinance their student loan debt at a lower rate 
when it would help more than 600,000 North Carolinians and they would benefit from this common sense reform. It's, a, it's just another example where Senator Hagan is out of touch with what we have to do to get our economy healed and make us safe and secure. We need to create jobs. Senator Hagan, if we cut the interest rate to zero, many of these students don't have jobs to pay off their loans. Senator Hagan's trying to find another regulatory solution like Obamacare, EPA overreach, and things that are killing jobs. These students, they, they should be admired for what they did to get their degree. They are thirsting for the opportunity to work and live their American dream. But Senator Hagan, instead of thinking about things, creating job opportunities that will let, let them pay off the student loans, just wants to go into this sort of new mentality to where all you're doing is trying to help people pay off debt versus give them the resources to grow and realize their American dream, to have a job. So Senator Hagan, I would say, why don't we stop regulating? Why don't we stop killing jobs? Why don't we start creating jobs so those students are less concerned with the interest rate and more concerned with what they're going to do with their vacation time? 30 seconds. You know, folks, you've just heard that Speaker Tillis does not support allowing students to refinance their student debt. We have graduates today whose debt is crippling them. They cannot buy that first home. They cannot uh, start a new business. Do you know that this would help 600,000 people in North Carolina? Um, interest rates on some of these graduates are up to 13 percent. You can get a fixed rate 30-year mortgage today for under 5 percent. To me this is a common sense measure that could help thousands of people, 600,000 just in North Carolina. Um, he's already made college more expensive. As I said, a 529 college savings tax credit done away with. A meal tax on a college student attending the university. Y'all, Speaker Tillis has already made college more expensive, and yet he won't do the simple thing of allowing students to refinance their debt. Um, you know, you can refinance every other thing, and yet not a student loan. Do you know that student yeah. loan debt now surpasses credit card debt in this country, and Speaker Tillis says no to allowing them to refinance? Speaker Tillis. I believe that those students who have graduate degrees and undergraduate degrees would love nothing more than to hear a senator say this, this is what I'm going to do for you when I'm your next U.S. Senator. I'm going to create the opportunity for you to get a job and your student loans will be paid off because I'm going to focus on the promise that we should be keeping to the young kids that are coming up today like the kid I was. I went to college, it took me 16 years to get my degree. I didn't go to college when I came out of high school. I went into a warehouse. It took me 16 years to get my degree. I never thought that I was going to rely on government to get me a job. I wanted to get a job. I wanted to pay off my debt. That's all the time we have for candidate questions. Now it's time for the closing statements. Each candidate gets 90 seconds. Speaker, tell us your first. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see that Senator Hagan and I have very different visions for America and very different approaches for how I would deal with President Obama versus how she would deal with President Obama. Rubber stamping his policies is not the solution. Having an independent voice and going to Washington and working for you is the solution. We need a senator that understands government doesn't create jobs, it kills jobs. We need a senator that will go to Washington and fulfill the promises that they make, not break the promises and make, make commitments that they don't deliver on. We need a senator that recognizes somebody like me. When I was a kid, I cut lawns, I was a paper boy, I was a short order cook, I didn't go to college right out of high school, I went to work in a warehouse. It took me 16 years to get my degree, by that time I was struggling to make ends meet and I was raising a family. But I'm here as a living example of the realization of the American dream. I want every American to have the same opportunity that I did. Senator Hagan went to Washington and she became a rubber stamp for President Obama's failed policies and she voted with them 96 percent of the time. Six years later, people are suffering and they're fearful. They're, they're worried about our safety and security. A vote for Senator Hagan is a vote for President Obama's failed policies. I want to go to Washington and help make America great again. We can get back to the nation of opportunity that we are the envy of the world. I'm asking for your vote and I'll appreciate your support. Senator Hagan. You know, Speaker Tillis, it is not how you grow up. It is how you treat people as a grown-up. 
And folks, Speaker Tillis has slammed shut the window of opportunity for so many people in our state because of his policies that have harmed North Carolinians. But George, I want to talk about what I've done to help people in North Carolina. I want to talk about what I've done to help our veterans. Jerry Ensminger is a Marine. He served at Camp Lejeune. His daughter, Jane, Janie, died of leukemia because of toxic contaminated water on the base. When I first got to the U.S. Senate, I worked with Jerry to help get answers and to get health care for the victims. Because of my bipartisan work with Senator Burr, we passed the Janie Ensminger law. So now families who worked and lived at Camp Lejeune can get health care. Folks, that's what I'm about helping people, uniting people. As we say in our state toast, North Carolina is the place where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great. I'm about supporting the middle class and being sure that everybody in our great state has that opportunity to grow both strong and great. Senator thank Hayden. you, George. And George, I wanted to thank you tonight for being here, and I wanted to ask all the voters in North Carolina, I would appreciate your support uh, come November the 4th, and God bless you and the people of North Carolina. I want to thank both of you for participating. Speaker Tillis, Senator Hagan, it was an honor to be here with you tonight. This does conclude the second North Carolina debate.